Okay, ladies and gentlemen, um, now here in our fancy new digs, um, we're going to continue with the program. Our next speaker is Dr. Janet Racklow. Um, she is an associate professor in wildlife ecology at the Department of Fish and Wildlife Resources at the University of Idaho in Moscow. Um, her research focuses on the ecology and conservation of mammals, especially those in isolated populations. Um, she and her students have been studying pygmy rabbits in Idaho, and she will share some of that work today in her conversation on sagebrush step restoration and pygmy rabbits. Thank you, Janet. Is this on okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, I want to start out by thanking Mike Coons, the other co-directors, and the local organizing committee for um, the invitation to come here, present some of our work, and learn a lot about sagebrush. So it's been a lot of fun. I also kind of like our more comfy digs here, so a little bit more intimate. Um, I'm going to start out with kind of an overview of ecology and natural history of pygmy rabbits. And then I tried to think, since I don't really work with sagebrush step restoration, I tried to think about what would be my wish list for information needs for this species associated with sagebrush step restoration. So I'll outline some of those questions. Uh, to the best of my ability, some of the information we have to address those questions, and maybe more importantly, some of those questions that really need to be addressed in the future. Um, so I'll start out with um, the overview. So pygmy rabbits, as the name implies, are small. and um, Oh gosh, I already forgot what she told me about forward. Okay, so for instance, this is not a pygmy rabbit. And this is a pygmy rabbit. So they average about 450 or so grams. Females are a little bit larger. Um, a pregnant female tops the scales at just about a pound. So they're fairly small, uh, look like small cottontails in reality. Pygmy rabbits have been described as both a dietary and habitat specialist associated with sagebrush. Um, during the winter, something like 98 to 99% of their diet consists of sagebrush. During the summer, it's still about 50% of the diet. The other 50% is comprised of um, grasses and forbs. Sagebrush also um, forms a very important component with respect to cover. Pygmy rabbits, like a lot of lagomorphs, sort of evolved at the bottom of the food chain and um, experience relatively high rates of predation. And so there's a rabbit kind of in the, the center there. So probably sagebrush is really their primary food as well as a primary source of cover. Um, one aspect of pygmy rabbit behavior that's a little bit unique is their burrowing. Pygmy rabbits um, dig and use year-round um, fairly complex burrow systems, anywhere from two to maybe ten different um, burrow entrances that might cover an area from four to six or seven meters across. And um, unlike European hares, pygmy rabbits um, inhabit these systems fairly solitarily. Not, I say fairly because occasionally we'll catch two or sometimes three animals out of a burrow system. It's usually associated with breeding and reproduction. So burrow systems are um, nice because they're indicative of pygmy rabbits. They're also an important part of uh, probably shelter from um, thermal extremes as well as predators. Reproduction in pygmy rabbits is not all that dissimilar from cottontails in some respects in that they can have up to three litters per year. I think in captivity in Washington with the Columbia Basin pygmy rabbits, they had some pull off four litters. It's quite unusual. Usually they have between two and se seven uh, kits per litter. All of this information, however, comes from captivity. And the reason why is that they're incredibly secretive about their young. Um, and in fact, until a few years ago, we really didn't know where they had their young in the wild. So pygmy rabbits dig these natal burrows, and they're single entrance burrows about the length of your arm that end in a nest chamber. And what's so incredible about them is that they, are, they can be camouflaged in a way that you and I can stand right above it and not see it. And so females will excavate these burrows, they'll give birth to the young, put them into the nest, and completely backfill the entrance, and come back usually once, sometimes twice a day, excavate the burrow, pull the young up, clean them, nurse them, put them back in, cover it back up till the next night. And incredibly difficult to find. Um, in some of our work where we finally were able to locate residential burrows, they were, um, at, or natal burrows, they were located away from residential burrows and subsequent work, it suggests they may not always be spaced far away. The distribution of pygmy rabbits um, is Fairly broad, this map is repeated over and over again and you think that they were everywhere, but it's really fairly patchy within this 
uh, range um, that's coincident with the Great Basin. This disjunct population up there in Washington is the Columbia Basin population that, that is um, no longer extant in the wild. It exists only in captivity. Um, that population is listed as a federally endangered distinct population segment that was listed in 2003, the same year that there was a petition for a range-wide um, ESA listing for the species. That um, petition was denied in part due to a lack of information on the status of the species. So I started to brainstorm, what would I really want to know um, if we wanted to restore uh, habitat for pygmy rabbits? And then I came up with a list of five uh, questions. The first is, where are pygmy rabbits? These are sort of basic questions, I realize. It might be um, really basic, particularly if you, uh, you guys on the sage grouse are like light years ahead of us here. So where do pygmy rabbits occur? What is good habitat? And I put good in quotations, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, how much space is needed to conserve viable populations of pygmy rabbits and beyond viable populations to conserve perhaps regional populations that might exchange individuals, maybe a metapopulation structure. Fourth, how can habitat quality be improved? And fifth, how will rabbits respond to restoration efforts? And so I want to go through each one of these questions, um, touch on what we know and what we don't know um, related to each of these topics. So starting out with, where are they? Um, we started working on pygmy rabbits in Idaho in 2002 and 2003, and at that time, oh gosh, that's what I meant to show you. At that time, this is what was known. There were 164 locations in the Idaho Conservation Data Center, and this is what was known for the distribution in the state. The rest of it was sort of all a question mark. So we started out to first ask, where should we start looking for rabbits? We took the approach of, um, creating a habitat model to help us identify areas where there were probably, there would be a higher probability of being uh, rabbit populations. And so the first thing we did was to go through the literature and find out what um, sorts of habitat characteristics are associated with pygmy rabbits. And there are two characteristics that consistently come uh, out. And that is sagebrush vegetation and soils that are deep enough to support burrows. And so we first created just a base map, a very broad brush base map, which included all vegetation types that were categorized as sagebrush and all areas that had soils that were greater than 60 centimeters. And you can see this really narrowed things down to five and a half million hectares. So that was a start. And beyond that, we asked how can we narrow that search down? So we used these 164 known locations to evaluate a suite of characteristics um, that are believed to be important for pygmy rabbits. Those include soil depth, soil texture, elevation, slope, and of course, uh, fire history. And without going through a lot of the details, what we came up with was a map like this, which helped us to take that base map, which is the, any color here, and then to sort it out the warmer colors indicating those habitats that are more similar to where pygmy rabbits now occur, the cooler colors representing uh, re habitats that are less similar. And so this allows us to help sort of stratify the area for surveying for pygmy rabbits. And kind of a caveat to this approach, because I occasionally get skewered on it, and that is you really can't, it's not appropriate to zoom into one particular spot and to expect there to be a rabbit there or even the appropriate habitat at that particular pixel. These types of models are really most useful for looking at it regionally going, you know, there's, there's a lot of great looking habitat up here. We ought to spend some time searching smaller patches of habitat across the central area and in the southeast, a nice, what looks like, reasonable chunk of habitat down in the Wahis. And that's the way these maps are really meant to be used. And similar approaches have been applied to searching for pygmy rabbits in Oregon and Montana and Wyoming. And now we followed this work up with ground surveys during the summer to evaluate the model to, and to also um, find pygmy rabbits. Subsequent to that, we started to do winter surveys. And winter surveys are advantageous for um, uh, several reasons. One is if you like to get out and ski, it's a great excuse to do it and get paid for it. Um, another is that pygmy rabbits are more visible in the winter against the snow. So there's actually three rabbits in this picture. Can everybody find three? Yeah, okay, a one, uh, a two here, and then a third one. Oh gosh, no, I'm not going to find it. Yeah. Okay, you're right, there's three. There's so easy to see in the winter. 
scratch that. And um, the other uh, characteristic that's really nice is that they leave tracks in the snow around their burrow systems, which are fairly distinctive. And these have been described, it sort of looks like a, someone walked through the area with snowshoes as leaping and landing pads or launching and landing, I don't remember. But these sorts of, of uh, characteristics where rabbits leap again and again onto the same pads over time, they wear into trails that form these kind of smoke, uh, spokes around, like spokes of a wheel around the burrow system. And um, it makes it fairly um, diagnostic for pygmy rabbits. And even from the air, we spent some time evaluating the um, uh, feasibility of doing aerial surveys from fixed wing aircraft. And actually, it's a pretty good way to, to um, find areas to come in on the ground and check. So a lot of biologists um, with the Idaho Department of Fish and Game, the Bureau of Land Management, the Forest Service have been out and doing really intensive surveys for pygmy rabbits in Idaho. And the uh, the result of that is much improved information on distribution. This is the most current information from the Idaho uh, Conservation Data Center. And we went in four years from 164 known locations to um, over 2,700. And so on this front, answering this question, where do rabbits occur, I think in Idaho and, and in most of the range states, we've made extraordinary progress and um, continue to search and continue to fill in some of the gaps. Um, for anybody who's interested in serving for pygmy rabbits, Helen Olmschneider with the BLM in Idaho uh, led an effort to draft a protocol on how to survey for pygmy rabbits. And that's available, that document is available from a link uh, on the Great Basin NDII site. And it's really useful if you're going to be out um, surveying for this species. So on to the second question, what is good habitat? And I want to address it first in a general sense, and then second, uh, specifically for pygmy rabbits. So the short answer to what is good habitat is habitat that promotes survival uh, and reproduction, or what's known as fitness. So that seems pretty straightforward. We should be able to figure out what good habitat is. So how do we know? And actually, in, in wildlife biology, the sort of traditional approach is a rather indirect approach to estimating uh, habitat that will promote survival and, and reproduction. So what we typically do is to measure habitat selection. So we compare areas where that are used by animals with areas that are not used by animals. And we say, okay, if these are areas that are used, these must be the areas that animals prefer. And so we measure selection and then we infer preference. And it's really making some assumptions there. From preference, we make a big assumption and that we assume that preferred habitats are those habitats that increase fitness, meaning increase survival and reproduction. I think Cam touched on some of this uh, earlier this afternoon. And this is a really indirect route to get at what types of habitat and what types of habitat component components affect survival and reproduction and consequently uh, population persistence. So a few words about spatial scale, and I realize that this is, um, you're getting hammered over the head with spatial scale issues today, so I'll make this quick. Scale has two components, right? We all know it has grain or resolution and extent, and extent being the size of the area. And these issues are really important, and you can tell wildlife biologists are really excited about them, because as Cam mentioned earlier, selection can and does occur at multiple levels but it's really critical for understanding the context of what your results are from habitat selection. And I'm going to use an example that has absolutely nothing to do um, with sagebrush for a minute. So these are doll sheep in Alaska, and I did some work um, asking questions about habitat selection for birth sites for doll sheep. And if we look at this habitat and we take measurements across a broad extent, guess what? Sheep use the steepest, most rugged terrain there is. Not really a surprise. But if you take measurements over the extent of a few meters, you find exactly the opposite, that sheep are choosing relatively gentle, relatively flat terrain. And so both of those answers are really correct answers, but they really depend on the context in which you ask that question. And I, I think that um, sagebrush is perhaps less dramatically heterogeneous, but still um, it really is important to use this idea of scale um, for context. So I'm going to review very briefly what is known about habitat associations for pygmy rabbits. And I'm going to break it down into sort of larger scale, sort of regional types of 
habitat components and smaller scale, which are really site-specific components. So at the regional scale, pygmy rabbits are consistently associated with sagebrush and other shrubs. So other shrubs, including rabbit brush, um, greasewood, bitter brush, but always associated with the sagebrush and usually a big sagebrush component. Um, within those areas, they are associated with relatively tall and dense sagebrush cover. So, um, and the relative is really important because at some sites, the tallest, densest sagebrush is knee high and at others, it's head high. So there's not an actual absolute height measurement that really describes pygmy rabbit habitat. Because of their burrowing, pygmy rabbits are usually associated with relatively deep soil. And there's some suggestion that they tend to use areas that have modest or moderate slopes. Um, it's often stated as something less than 8%, although I think that um, this may change as we get more information about the species. And usually um, they're associated with some sort of uh, superficial uh, deposits or alluvial fans. And fire history is important, and I think this is something that is perhaps intuitive and just hasn't been pinned down. In some of our work, we found that there were no pygmy rabbits present in areas that had experienced fires within the last 15 years. Probably this should be extended much, much longer. Okay, there have been several studies that have asked site-specific questions about pygmy rabbits. It has compared the habitat right over a burrow system with habitat 15 meters away, or delineated a home range and looked at habitat within the home range with habitat just outside the home range. So we're really talking about small scale studies here. And again, tall and dense sagebrush canopy cover um, is important. Um, at the smaller scales, shrub uh, structural complexity seems to play a role in that rabbits use areas that have greater structural complexity. Um, it's been noted that there is greater dead uh, shrub cover or greater uh, dead to live canopy cover in areas that are used by pygmy rabbits. With grasses and forbs, there's really no clear trend. Some studies have suggested that rabbits use areas with lower forb cover, higher for or higher cover of some grasses and lower cover of other grasses. So there really isn't a clear trend. But what these studies haven't considered is the impact that pygmy rabbits might have on the habitat themselves. And I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, they again are associated with deep soils even on a small spatial scale and uh, often there's a cutoff of about 50 centimeters for uh, a minimum soil depth. Also with soil composition, soils that where pygmy rabbits are, are present have been identified as having greater sand content and lower clay content. And lastly, um, microtopography seems to be often associated with the presence of pygmy rabbits. So microtopography like Nema mounds or drainages, hillsides, but small uh, roles of topography that might support deeper soils. So that's really what we know about pygmy rabbit habitat. And it's not a lot, actually, I have to say. And could you take this and say this, these characteristics obviously make good habitat? And I'm not sure you could. I think you could say that these areas characterize places where pygmy rabbit populations persist, but I think this is still an indirect way to get at what is good habitat for pygmy rabbits. Okay, third question here is how much space is needed to support pygmy rabbit populations? And I think that there are several questions you could ask about species. Home range size always seems to come up first, and it's a question that is uh, not necessarily informative to answer without a lot of um, caveats and qualifiers, so I hope I can convince you of that. Other questions that are likely to be important, are there seasonal movements? Do these animals shift their ranges um, between seasons? What are dispersal patterns? How far do these animals go? Can they uh, connect populations that are isolated by some distance? Um, how connected are populations now? And if we ask in the past, how connected were populations? And probably a related question is, what are barriers to movement? What sorts of human-made or natural physiogeographic features either um, filter or stop movement by the species? I have two PhD students that are currently addressing uh, some of these questions, and I'll just present a little bit of their work. Uh, first, I'm going to do an aside on the home range concept, just so this will be a two-minute aside. We all know the home range is just the sort of <coughs> Workforce of understanding space use. And 
It comes from Burt's uh, original 1943 paper and a great statement that the area traversed by an individual in its normal activities of food gathering, mating, and caring for young. So pretty intuitive, pretty basic idea. Um, the idea has been expanded by linking it to the concept of a cognitive map. And that is we know that animals choose to be in some areas and choose not to be in other areas. But that implies that they have knowledge of those other areas if they choose not to be there. So that perhaps the, the home range is not just where they are, but it includes their knowledge of places that they choose to avoid. And these are all great ideas, and um, they're terrific. And home range, in essence, has become synonymous with space use in the wildlife literature. Um, and I think it's not a good thing. I think it's a great intuitive idea, but it's extraordinarily um, challenging to quantify in a way that's meaningful and consistent. Um, and I'm not going to harp on that anymore, but just that people always ask me, what is the home range of a pygmy rabbit? And it's a question that always um, is challenging to answer. So having said that, there are four studies that have published home range results for pygmy rabbits based on telemetry. And these are all master's thesis studies. And you can see that they reported five different types of home range estimators, which right there makes them um, not comparable across uh, studies at all. Um, some of these were in the winter or the summer. One of them was in the winter. Fairly limited sample sizes. So it's a little bit tough to draw some um, definitive conclusions about space use needs by pygmy rabbits from this. However, if we look across the four that have reported summer home ranges, you can see, and broken them out for males and females, that males tend to use substantially larger home ranges, although it varied from 20 hectares to something down to 5 hectares. So it varies over a pretty large range. But still, males in all of the studies use, use larger home ranges, and it looks like during the summer, pygmy rabbits are using substantially larger ranges than winter. We've been doing some studies in the Lemhi Valley. It's south of Salmon, about 50 miles. And we have three study sites there where we've been following um, colored rabbits and looking at survival and movement, space use, among other things. And so just give you a picture of one of these sites. Um, these sites are characterized by Nima Mounds. So these dark uh, areas are areas of tall uh, Wyomiensis uh, that are supported on these micro... Um, these Lima mounds, and in between there's lower uh, shrub cover and forward and grass cover. And the three sites are fairly similar, although they differ somewhat in their stru uh, vegetation structure. So Dana Sanchez has been looking at adult patterns of space use. She's used, used radio telemetry and asked questions about the effects of sex, season, study area, and also annual variation on space use. And we've been reporting multiple estimators of home range size in part to make our studies comparable to other studies. She's also been looking at other parameters of space use. Oh gosh. Okay. So really quickly, the sort of um, traditional methods for trapping, handling, and radio collars. The radio collars that we use on these rabbits <coughs> are about five grams. These are radio tags that are blue on tags for juveniles. They weigh about a gram, and I'll um, get to that in just a minute. So I'm going to just present a summary of what we found for adult space use. And if you're um, into home range, we used a fixed kernel with a likelihood cross-validation. And I'll talk more about that later. We found that males use relatively large home range, that pigments in general use relatively large home ranges. Males use significantly larger ranges than females, particularly during the breeding season. And home range size varied markedly across their study size. So I'll just show you, show you this figure which is home range size on the top here for males and on the bottom here for females and for our three different study sites. And so you can see that there's a large range um, across study sites in home range size. So for males during the breeding season, it's up around 20 uh, hectares at one of our sites. In contrast, uh, for males during the non-breeding season, it's down around 2 hectares at one of our sites. So when someone asks me, what is the size of a pygmy rabbit home range, and I start to go on about, well, it depends on the sex and the season, yeah, yeah. It really does make a difference. Okay, Wendy S. Zumpf is a PhD student who is looking at natal dispersal and genetic connections among populations. This figure shows the uh, different populations that she sampled. She will be analyzing these data 
on local, on regional, and then on a statewide extent to ask questions about gene flow among populations. Um, she's also been tagging uh, juvenile rabbits. This is a juvenile here with uh, one of those radio tags on. And then looking at dispersal. And what we found for juvenile dispersal was really surprising. This figure shows, just to orient you, this is age in weeks for the juvenile rabbits and distance to the natal area. So this is the distance that they traveled from where they were born. And what you see is that um, a lot of animals don't ever get very far. They don't even get a kilometer away from where they move. However, this is for females. Those females that do move, move and move far and move rapidly. So we have females move up to 12, 10 and 12 kilometers within the course of a couple of days. And for whatever reason, when they get to where they're going, they stop and they stay there. So these animals disperse between about 8 and 13 weeks of age. They do it rapidly and then they stop and over fairly long distances. This is the same uh, figure for males. Uh, slightly different story here in that almost all males disperse at least about a kilometer. A couple of males um, did disperse up to uh, five and six kilometers. So males appear to have a greater propensity to disperse but to disperse shorter distances. Regardless, this um, uh, was much, much farther than our anticipation and suggests that pygmy rabbits can in fact connect among populations if there's suitable habitat for <coughs> them. Okay, on to the last question. Um, last two questions. And I guess I'm going to take a, a little bit of a, a cop out here and say I don't think we can really address these questions right now. In that um, what we really need is really a functional understanding of habitat. And that means a direct link between the habitat and survival and reproduction. And that isn't available at this time for rabbits, but I think it's something that needs to be done. And the work here in Utah to um, look at uh, the response to habitat manipulation is a first step in, in being able to do that. So one last point here. Um, that I mentioned earlier that pygmy rabbits might affect their habitat. This is uh, a rabbit burrow and some of the sagebrush in and around a burrow that's been occupied for multiple years. And what we've seen in some of our sites is that burrow systems that are occupied repetitively uh, across years, we have about six years of data now, seem to, many of them get into kind of a donut of sagebrush um, with rabbit brush in the center. And once they're abandoned, look something like this, where there's a, a donut of sagebrush around the outside that's filled in with rabbit brush. And so there's a potential for pygmy rabbits to affect their um, environment. The reason this is of interest is um, pygmy rabbits have sort of anecdotal history, um, anecdotal evidence of kind of shifting across the landscape. So if we start to think at broader spatial scales, find that populations are here at some point and they're not, and then they're in another place, and they seem to shift. And there's the potential for rabbits themselves to impact the habitat to make it unsuitable for uh, occupancy, and that's a question that um, one of my new students, Amanda Price, is just starting to address. So some concluding thoughts on uh, sagebrush step restoration and pygmy rabbits. Although there aren't historic data on distribution of the species to be able to document we've lost X number of animals, there certainly is information to document loss of historic habitat. And the two characteristics across scales and across the, the range of the species that are consistently associated with pygmy rabbit presence are big sagebrush and soils that support um, burrow, burrow construction. I think that this is a big unknown. The, the quality, the, the cover, the composition, the quality of grass and forage component. It's undoubtedly important as a food source during the summer, but how that really translates into persistence of populations is, is unknown and really needs uh, further, further investigation. And I think this is kind of the crux of, of my message today, and that is we really need a better understanding of, of how habitat components affect individual survival and reproduction to be able to understand how they might respond to uh, habitat manipulation. And I didn't touch on this, but if restoration is likely to be followed by reintroduction, there are currently reintroduction efforts that are ongoing for the Columbia Basin uh, pygmy rabbit that's the endangered distinct population segment and they've met a number of challenges and I think those uh, projects will kind of light the way and provide some information for how we might proceed with reintroduction following habitat restoration. 
just want to acknowledge uh, my students, collaborators who have worked on this, and also uh, many biologists and agencies that have supported this work um, over time. So thank you.